really good. I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today. It's called bringing your brand position to life, right? So anyone who has been to earlier coffee shops, <clears throat> we've covered the first half of Imaginazing's Live Your Story process. You don't need to have seen those or um, gone through any of that stuff to be able to do what we're going to do today because the second half of the Live Your Story process is what we're going to talk about today. And that's where we actually bring our position to life. This is where we start to create <clears throat> the look, the feel, the sound. What is it? What is it? Uh, what do we sound like out in the marketplace? And specifically, what kind of tools and tactics can we use to get in front of customers and make sure that our work is actually making an impact on our business and our bottom line? So, today, what we're going to do is we're going to start by talking about um, the brand definition process. We're going to finish that out real quick, make sure we do all that, and then identify our key goals and objectives. What are some strategies to make sure that what we're doing is on target and not just random acts of marketing like we like to talk about? And then finally, we're going to, we're going to illustrate and actually walk through um, how to do a creative brief and how to make sure the messaging we're creating is as on, um, on target as possible, right? So first, previously on Coffee Shop. <clears throat> um, Imagination uses the three, and by the way, we like our lame jokes. We're gonna laugh at our own lame jokes, so it's okay if you do, and buckle up, it's just gonna get worse. Um, <clears throat> we use a three-step uh, three process. One is uncover. That's all of our research that's gonna be things like um, qualitative and quantitative studies with both employees and customers. We're gonna get in front of our own team. We're gonna pull people from all levels of our organization, C-suite all the way down to people who are maybe on our manufacturing floors if we're a manufacturer, who are in our front offices if we're maybe a service industry, um, and so forth. We want to get them into a room and talk about who we are. We're going to do competitive analyses, right? So that's all part of Uncover. We've already covered some of that stuff. If you've missed it and you want to see it, it is all online. Um, and you're able to see coffee shop number one. The second phase then is uh, what we call define. The first half is where you're identifying, you take all that research you just did and you're identifying what are those four, five, six things at max that really set us apart. That if people understood these things about us, they would, that would trip them into doing business with us, right? Those become our uh, unique selling propositions, the rational elements. And we connect emotions to those, those are UBPs because we know people make decisions based on emotion, right? <clears throat> unique buying propositions. And then finally we put it all together into a positioning statement. Okay, so that catches us up to kind of where we are. That positioning statement is just one long sentence that is really clear and concise and that we can use internally. And it says things like who we exactly are, who we're talking to, what our point of difference is, and most importantly, why they should emotionally care, okay? Today, though, now we, that's all kind of strategy. That's all like background stuff, right? And it's, it's, it's good, but by now we're really antsy. We need to get stuff out there because that's not moving. What, all the work that we just did is not getting us new customers and it's not doing anything yet because it's just sitting up here in our head. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna finish off Define. We're gonna figure out, okay, well, now we did all that background. How do we actually bring it to life? And then finally, how do we, once we have it, once we know exactly what we're going to look like and sound like, how do we get it in front of people? And that's the align phase. So today, we're finishing up on, these, on the latter half of this. And why are we doing all this? Like, why are we spending so much time really thinking through this strategy stuff? It's for this reason. We want to look at these ads, right? These are, now, this is a business consumer. But what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean... So the, uh, the align phase is where kind of the exciting stuff happens, right? So we probably want to jump straight to tactics because those are the things we know that we need and those are the things that in our heads are going to look really awesome. And these, these are awesome ads. These are fantastic. They're, they're brilliant, honestly. They're, they're fun. They show the personality of the company. They um, tell a whole story without any words. And so this looks really exciting and we want to get to that point, but the question we need to ask ourselves is how did they get there? Because these don't happen on accident. And so those are the result of a really strong strategy. That's kind of the main theme for today is that we may want to jump to tactics, but we need to make sure that we have a strong strategy first because the stronger the strategy, the stronger the marketing is going to be. Yeah, it's really easy. You know, and we do it ourselves, it's really easy to sit down and say, well, we need a new website, right? Or we need to update our trade show, or we gotta get, we gotta get some new materials in front of people. Let's, let's create a sales kit that our people can take out. 
When you start thinking that way, if you skip over all this other stuff, you will end up with pieces that just start to diverge really quickly because they're, they're just not, off, they're not on topic. And so today we're gonna talk about the, how you lay down that strategy so that once you get all of this in place, everything else that follows is on mark and it's just gonna stay really tight and consistent. Right. So yeah, first we're gonna wrap up the uh, define phase and all those elements that go into the define phase. Right? Yep, yeah, so first we gotta close the loop on define. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. So when you're developing a brand and you're developing the actual look and feel of it, Imagineasium uses um, what we call a brand language manual. Now this is not the same as like brand standards. Brand standards would be a very large document. It's gonna have things like how much white space is around your logo, what size is your font or headlines and all that kind of stuff. What we use is a brand language manual. This is more of a guideline. And this, this is a, a piece, this will become your Bible that consistently <clears throat> that makes sure that everything that you do is consistent and 100% accurate, whether it's you doing it, or maybe it's HR creating some pieces, or maybe it's your sales team creating some pieces, or maybe it's even vendors that you're working with. This is your DNA. This is, the, this is gonna be the Bible. What's gonna be in it is everything that we just talked about, all the stuff that you, you discovered from the first half of Define, carried through with things like brand personality. What if we were a person, if our brand, like how does our brand present itself to the world? How does it speak? What is its voice? All the design things that are just traditionally in there, right? Like color, typography, imagery, iconography, etc. And then finally you wrap it all up with some sample designs. The important thing though, is that now we're into a realm where it is really easy to get sucked into opinion, right? Like, if there's one thing everyone has an opinion on, it's color. Let's just, let's just be honest, right? Like, I love hot pink. I don't actually love hot pink. But <laughs> if I did, I may have like a personal, um, I may have personal biases. We never want to work off of opinion. That's a, that's, that's, a real, that's a real danger and a real risk of creating something that's not effective. So we always start with research. Up here you can see an example of um, this is a construction industry, right? And this was some um, color palette research we did for a client a long time ago. What do you see? You see everyone is black, red, and white. Black, red, and gray. Black, red, and tan. Those are the colors for the construction industry. It's just been kind of decided organically over years. Now what does that mean? You also have a couple people like Power or Pepper up there who've bucked the trend. They've gone green, they've gone blue, they're, doing, they're choosing different colors, right? Not saying one way or the other is right or wrong. It, <clears throat> it very often makes sense to pick the same kind of colors, to pick the same kind of typography because you wanna make sure that you are recognized as a part of that industry. At least do this though, so that when you put it in front of your um, superiors or you're putting it in front of your board, or you're putting it in front of your employees, you can say we have research, it's not just Caleb's lame opinion, right? <clears throat> And so from there, the next step is to start to identify who you are, like if your company were a person. Right, so brand personality is, is what it sounds like. It's if thinking about if your company were a person, what would its style be? What would it act like? How would it carry itself? How would that, that person interact with you? So, for example, if you're thinking about your company as a person, would it be, would it be Wolverine, Hugh Jackman, or would it be... Greatest Showman, Hugh Jackman. Very different characters, right? Or would it be Kate and Leopold, Hugh Jackman? Or Australia, Hugh Jackman? Such range this guy has, right? <laughs> and believe it or not, you can think of other people besides Hugh Jackman. Um, is your brand an innovator? Is it kind and gentle? Is it strong and aggressive? Is it an adventurer or an explorer or a mad scientist? All of these things are valid ways to think about your, your brand's personality. Now, to be fair, this is not really the way that we get at personality. Uh, we don't necessarily look through pictures of celebrities and, and figure it out that way. Um, but it helps to abstract. I mean, we do, but that's just like between well, us. Yeah. Like, that's just the joke side. In the yeah, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> obviously Hugh Jackman. Um, <laughs> right, so it helps to abstract it a little bit. So what you might hear more about is things like this, things like archetypes. These are the 12 Jungian archetypes, right? You've got the explorer, or the, the lover, or the rebel, the magician, things like that. This is a really, really deep topic, and if you're interested in it, great. It's really useful, and I would encourage uh, looking into it. But for our purposes, we generally like to 
simplify it a little further, use a tool like this. This is, we call these personality sliders. So this is just a way of assigning character traits to your company, figuring out where it fits on a spectrum. So if you can't see what that says, it's elite to mass appeal, serious to playful, conventional to rebel, things like that. So you can sort of plot how do we want communication and interaction with our brand to feel from a personality perspective? Do we want to be the friendly rebel or the authoritative, serious brand? Things like that. And so how does, how does personality show up? Um, sometimes it's really subtle, sometimes it's really overt. So practically speaking, it can be a really useful tool when it comes to messaging. You may remember the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC ads. And this is where they actually literally personified uh, the brands. So you've got, you know, boring, stuffy Dwight Schrute PC guy on the left, and then you've got the hip, young, creative, fun Mac guy on the right. This was a very, very clear way of bringing brand personality to life. Mm -hmm. It's also very useful internally when you have, especially the archetype thing, so the Jungian archetypes or there are other types of archetypes people use in marketing, it becomes a shorthand that your team can use. So if you say we are, um, yeah, we're the rebel, right? So Tesla kind of fits that rebel mold. That just has, an, it, it has all, these, all these layers inside of it that someone gets into their head that you don't have to delineate out, like, well, we speak with this kind of, aggressive tone or anything like that. You can just say rebel and everyone in your organization kind of gets it. They kind of understand it, right? So finding those shorthands is really helpful for internal alignment. Yep. So then kind of one step further, once you've defined personality as brand voice. Brand voice is really how does that personality express itself through communication, specifically through words. Um, and so this, this takes it a step further. This is really about uh, identifying what are those adjectives that would describe the way that we speak. What are the words that we use and don't use? Um, how do we even construct our sentences? Are we short and punchy and energetic, or are we really, really thoughtful and, and a little more <coughs> academic, things like that? So this is just an example of, of what you might put together for um, defining your voice. It doesn't have to be fancy, just this is a paragraph and some, some adjectives. Um, but it gives you a sense of what, um, how you should create messaging so that it all sounds consistent and so that it differentiates you in the marketplace. So this example here is all about energy and optimism, being aspirational, at the same time feeling human and approachable. Um, so it's just a, a mix of traits that when you put, to, put them together in a specific way, that's going to be kind of a hallmark of the way you do messaging. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you, that's how you sound in the world. That's how you talk to everyone. But now you've got to put it all together into visual pieces. We're not going to spend time up here telling you how to design things, right? I don't think that's very valuable or useful. People understand how to do that. But we will talk through at least some considerations that go into this. So one, your brand language manual, if you're doing this internally yourselves, design it in your new brand. Make sure it, it is a piece that when you hand it off to a vendor, when you hand it off to your internal team, they can use it as a guideline. They can look at how things come together. It'll include things like typography, right? What are our fonts? Again, make sure you're looking at your industry standards. Are they all sans serif? Then you're not gonna use some script cursive font, right? Et cetera. Look at images, give guidelines on images. What type of imagery speaks to our brand? Is it, is it black and white? Is it full color? Are we shooting into the light? Are we making sure that we compose with things in front? Are there people, are there not people? Are they looking at the camera, are they not looking at the camera, et cetera, right? Color, again, color is very opinion-based. Don't let it be, let it become, uh, use behavioral science. Why do uh, medical companies, hospitals, and doctor's offices always use blue? because blue says calm, right? It says confidence. Why is McDonald's red and yellow? Because red is scientifically proven to um, increase appetite. So make sure you're using that kind of stuff. And then put it all together into some sample pieces. We try to pick four to five that are gonna represent throughout the entire organization. So maybe something for HR, maybe something for sales or an external piece, maybe our website, something like that. Um, put it together so people have some templates or some styles to start from, right? That's called the design platform. Okay, so that brings us through define. We're now done, we've, we've done all the work. We got everything put together. We know exactly um, who we wanna be and how we wanna sound, but why have we done all this and why does it matter? And where is it gonna go from here? 
So, <clears throat> John? Yeah, so why does it matter? Um, it really, the, the main thing is that this is all about emotional connection. And so, emotional connection is something that, uh, you know, Caleb talked about the USPs and the UBPs, that we've got the rational side, but we need to connect that to the emotional side because that's how people make decisions. And when you're talking about emotional connection, one of the interesting things is that it's, it's very easy to think that's the realm of consumer marketing, right? Because we think about the things that we've seen out in the world. We think about um, those Lego ads. They make you feel something, right? We think about uh, Super Bowl ads with Clydesdales and puppies, right? It's, it's a very obvious emotional connection. But studies show that when it comes to real deep emotional connection, that consumer advertising, as little as 10% of, of the people that interact with brands on a consumer level are actually emotionally connected, 10 to 40% of consumers. Whereas on the B2B side, it's significantly higher. You find much more, over 50%, emotional connection between a, a B2B buyer and the brands they interact with. And this makes sense, right? It makes sense because, um, you know, from a consumer perspective, if I go to the store and I'm, I'm, I buy some Legos and then I have buyer's remorse, um, best case, I can just return it. It's a low stakes proposition. There aren't really, it's not going to kill me. Um, worst, worst possible scenario probably is you know, I have to explain to my wife why I still buy Legos, you know? That's, it's either way, the stakes are not super, super dire, but in a B2B setting, you might be responsible for a multi-million dollar piece of equipment or software platform or something, and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anxiety because if that goes wrong, your, your job could be done, your company could be done. So we need to make strong emotional connections because it's a very emotional purchase and we need to be able to address those fears. On top of that, 84% um, of B2B buyers don't see any difference when they look at different vendors or suppliers or companies um, based on business value and features and benefits. So what that means is all of the things that you kind of like to gravitate towards in B2B marketing, um, the price and the quality and the service, those are table stakes. All of that is equal in the eyes of, of the customer. So if we're going to really address those fears and we're going to connect with them and set ourselves apart, we have to make a connection on a level that is deeper than just the rational. So kind of the, the summary of all of that is that B2B customers are proven to be significantly more emotionally attached um, to the brands they interact with. So it takes, it makes sense. Yep. So, so that's the end. Thank you for coming. Of part one. <laughs> no. So now we're going to take it uh, to the next step, and this is where the interactive part comes up, right? So your turn. We're going to start to, what we want to do is start to, we're into the align phase. How do we actually do that? How do we find this emotion that we're talking about? And how do we um, create messaging around it? So, sample company, Vandalay Industries. Yes, that Vandalay Industries, right? So, <clears throat> only this one's gonna be a little bit different. We put, we're put, yep, we're handing out a packet right now. So, what you're gonna get in front of you is going to be USPs and UBPs for this fake company. Now, this is gonna be tough, right? And, one, it's a process you've probably never been a part of, and two, it's a, it's a make-believe company in an industry that you may not have experience with. But the industry that we're, we want to work on, or that we're going to put Vandalay Industries into, is medical technology. So they're, a, they're an electronics manufacturing service provider for the medical technology industry, okay? So they, basically, they create really complicated pieces that go into our bodies and keep us alive. And the problem is that the, the work that they do is incredibly complex. And it's an industry that is incredibly highly regulated. It's incredibly expensive to do. And there are only a few people who ever benefit from these devices. So now we've done work with companies like Plexus, and there's another company over in Minnesota that we um, work with. And 
they're in this industry. So we have some experience with this. That's why we're using it as kind of a platform. But I just want to make sure that we're clear. None of the work that we're about to show you or that we're going to go through is stuff that we've done for other clients. We're going to do it. We just did it ourselves here for, for today's presentation. Like, like literally this morning. <laughs> right. That's why we kind of got a late start. We're just finishing this up. No. <laughs> Okay, so what you're seeing are some USPs and UBPs. Let's talk about Vandalay because what we're gonna do then is we're gonna identify how do we figure out what their goals should be and how do we then create some, um, some creative messaging around those goals. So there are things like, um, one, their niche is highly complex. This is the stuff that other companies can't do. Two, they are not a consumer electronics manufacturer, so they don't make millions of these. They make thousands. They make tens of thousands maybe, right, at most. Um, three, they're in, a very, uh, they're in a very highly regulated industry, so getting FDA approval on these kinds of devices is really complicated, um, et cetera. So I'll give you a second to kind of look through there. You can look at the positioning. Let's go ahead and read that on the back <clears throat> inside there. Laura, I'm going to steal your copy so I can just read through it in front of everyone. All right. So Vandalay industries, their position. To decision makers at medical device companies, Vandalay Industries is a design, engineering, and manufacturing company specializing in the creation of commercial and commercialization of complex medical devices. Okay, that's everything that we just talked about. Why are they different? Because they have committed the thinking, the supply chain resources, and the dedicated engineering team you need to solve the product challenges others haven't been able or willing to. We know that there are, for this type of industry, We'll say there's some shady practices, and I guess maybe it's not shady, but there are a lot of companies who will say, yeah, we can do that. And they'll start working on it, and they'll, get, they'll take a ton of your money, and then they'll get to a certain point and say, nope, the problem is just too complex. We can't get through this, right? And so that leaves you in a pickle. So this is a company that has really committed the, the engineering genius it takes to get these products made. And then why do, they, why do they do what they do? Because they understand the impact your dream can make in someone's life. And that's a dream we deeply believe in and want to help make real. I mean, we're talking about stuff that literally saves lives. I mean, this, is, this was some of the most exciting work we've done in our careers when we were working with some of these companies. This is really cool stuff because they're behind the scenes on that. Okay. Oh, so what are their problems? The reason we picked this company is because we think they probably have problems that are similar to you, which are, one, they're so complex, no one really understands what they do. The way they talk about themselves, everyone, they're just like, what? no one gets us. No one gets all the things that we can do. We've heard that from many, many clients. It doesn't matter if they're in construction or they're in anything else. They, they just have a hard time finding a way to talk about what they do. Two, their story isn't being told by everyone the same way. They've got a sales guy in Boston who's saying one thing, and they've got a sales guy in LA who's saying another thing, and they don't jive. And we got our people on the plant floor talking out in the community, and that doesn't jive, right? So that's a problem. And then three, because no one's telling the right story, they don't understand, they're not able to fill open positions. And I think we've heard this quite a bit too, because they can't, commit, they can't convince people to come on board. If all you're doing is, is, is trying to sell salary and benefits, it's not gonna work. You have to have a story that resonates and is compelling, right? Problems are only goals, or they only, they only become opportunities. So goal number one, if no, one's, if no one knows what we do, we gotta launch this new brand that we just did all this work on externally. Problem number two, obviously we need some internal training, so there's gonna be an internal component. And then three, once we're done with our external brand, we wanna take that and take the learnings from it and start to create a new employer brand. And it'll follow a very similar process, um, just with a very key difference in audience, right? So, how do we do that? <clears throat> Goals, objectives, tactics. This is where a lot of times people wanna start just down here in the tactics. And we already identified some goals but we need to start filling in some objectives, right? So let's just take this first goal and let's work through some of the, some of the ways that we would start to break this down, right, John? So launch our new brand externally. We want to get this, we did all this work, we want to get it out into the uh, marketplace. What are some objectives that'll fall underneath that? How do we do that? One, we'll throw one up there and then we'll just start shouting out some ideas. And I want to make sure that I say quick before I do this, is if you start to come up with tactics first, that's okay. We do that too. What you'll do is you'll take those tactics and you'll start to look for common threads between them, circle them, and they become an objective. So for example, maybe someone is saying, well, we know we gotta update our trade show because trade shows are the big, big way that we do business, right? Well, trade shows and sales kits and all that kind of stuff, we might lump all that together as sales team support. Our business, Vandalay Industries in specific, and probably yours, 
does most of its work through sales team support. What are some other objectives? How else would we try to launch a new brand externally? John, thoughts, anyone? Just throw something out, throw a tactic out. What else are you gonna do? If you got a new brand, how are you gonna get it in front of people? Or what are things you have done in the past, yeah. if you've ever that's done a rebrand? Yeah. New website, perfect. That's exactly, that's always on our list too. Anyone else? Social media, perfect. What are, what are, those are great examples. Okay, so let's do those. Because social media and website are two that we would lump together. And we would call those, I'm gonna click through these, passive digital presence, right? So we're gonna look at, if we know 70% of people are making a decision whether they wanna work with you before they even um, pick up a phone or before they even email you, you gotta make sure that your social media presence, if you're part of any trade associations, if, if your company is profiled digitally anywhere, all of that is now consistent, and that would also include your website, right? So, um, and then maybe we'll say active lead generation, maybe things like um, content marketing, or how do we start to feed the top of that funnel? We start to build that kind of stuff out. That's when then you take those tactics and you start to list them individually. So for Vandalay Industries, and other companies like them, we know that on-site tours are really important. If they can get a customer onto their facilities, whether it's in you know, Bangkok or in, in, in Chicago, um, they, they convert that business nine times out of 10. So we need to try to drive on-site tours. They'll probably, sales teams are probably gonna need presentations. They're gonna need their trade show updated. They're gonna need some specific market sector literature, all that kind of stuff. So we start to identify all those tactics, but we lump them together as an objective. And again, kind of some of the, the value of thinking it, of it this way is really what we want to underscore, right? That we said everybody loves to jump right to tactics, and you could probably think of a million things if you really just sat down and thought about it. But being able to then um, reverse engineer it or work within this framework of understanding we need to have strategy, we need to have objectives, we need to have tactics. We need to have the strategy and the objectives. We can't just jump straight to tactics. It's going to make a, a big difference all on its own. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what do you do with it once you have that? We put together a communications plan. Now we, have, now we know what our pieces are. We can start to map out how does it actually implement. So what you see up here is an example of an Imaginasium, uh, Imaginasium communications plan. This is just one piece of it. There will be other paperwork and other literature that goes with it, of course. But you can see all the important details are here, right? We've got one, who's the client in our case, but a business goal and audience. That's always most important. Who are we talking to? We can't ever forget that. And what is the main business goal that we're trying to achieve with this one? Two, we've got our objective. So for this one, it was, as an example, we're gonna bring Vandalay Industries' new brand to life and exciting and interactive tools our sales force can use to convert warm leads to on-site tours and from on-site tours to signed contracts. Three, we have to have outcomes. We have to know how we're gonna, how we're gonna measure success. So maybe it's like 20% increase in tours and 30% increase or 35% increase in conversions from there. For all the tactics that we just talked about, we're gonna list and then five, some kind of a, a calendaring out budget. Make sure you understand exactly how long this stuff's gonna take and what your budget is for implementation. So that's just a simple way of trying to put everything onto one single sheet so we can visually track where we're at in the process. Okay, so we got strategy in place. What does yeah. it sound like? <clears throat> yeah, so when the strategy is in place, you may be thinking to yourself, there's still a gap, and that's because there is. There's still a gap between the strategy and then what you actually say and what you actually um, do in terms of marketing. So the way that we wanna close that gap is we wanna build a bridge with a creative brief. Now the creative brief, um, we need, to, we need to not just build a bridge between the strategy that we created and the messaging, but build a strong, good bridge. Um, and so the, the creative brief is specifically designed to help us gain insight and uh, increase the, the level of our, our creative concepts, make them better, make them connect more strongly, more on that emotional level. So the creative brief, we use a template that has five fields. They're in order. Um, a key fact, we're going to get into this in more detail, a customer problem or consumer problem, a marketing goal, a creative strategy, and then kind of the linchpin, the important, the, the really, um, the, the meat of the creative brief is the reason why. 
So a couple of things that a creative brief is going to do for us as we bridge that gap from strategy to messaging. One is that it keeps us focused on the customer and their problems and their needs and their worries and concerns. That's super important if we're gonna do better marketing um, compared to the competition. It's, it's a hard exercise to do, to be honest. It's really easy to punt on. It's easy to say, I've got five fields. If I just fill them out, I can move on and I can get to the good stuff. You wanna try not to do that. Um, it takes a little bit of work, but the work is always worth it because you're gonna have a better result in the end. And then because it is so focused on the customer, one thing that you'll notice is that it's not until field four that we actually even talk about ourselves as a company or talk about the client as a company. So this really helps us to narrow our focus on uh, what our message is gonna be, who it's for, and how it's gonna connect on an emotional level. Yeah. So because this is kind of hard concept to, we're gonna go through one, we're gonna try to create one for Bandelay Industries here in a minute, but we wanna make sure, we kind of show you an example of how we've done this in the past, because we think it'll help um, to get you thinking about it. So for many years we worked with Purvey Health and did marketing for them. One of the service lines that we had to do, this is a creative brief we put together for their bariatric service line. And we, we used this one specifically because Bariatric is kind of a, when we got the assignment, we were like, oh, it's kind of a risky topic, right? Like it's a, it's a little controversial, or it's not controversial, but it just feels like you're talking about people who are overweight and what is, is it judgmental and how do we talk about it safely? And you know, the easy thing to do is to just go out and say, bariatric surgery can help you lose weight and we have proven successes and our doctors are the, do the most in the, in the state or whatever, right? But that's not emotional, because we have to understand exactly what's, in the, what's going on with some of these people. So here's how we filled this out. This is what we went to market with. First, so key fact. Key fact is always just what's objectively going on out in the world. What is, what is going on that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with us, it's just something that's affecting our customers. One, for, for them, it was bariatric surgery is one of the most successful ways to lose weight with proven benefits to your health. The, the medical science is just clear, right? What's the problem though? Bariatric surgery feels drastic. And like you're admitting you've failed to lose weight and will never be able to do it on your own. For a lot of these people, they just kind of, uh, you know, through research and looking at forums and following some focus, or not focus groups, but really listening to people talking about who are going through this, it feels like they're giving up, right? For them, a lot of them, it feels like, ugh, I've, if I just eat a little bit better, I just exercise a little bit better, I can still do this on my own. And, and a lot of times we found through research that's just not the case. Like you're gen metabolically, your body has changed. It is just very difficult to change or to lose weight by yourself, right? So our goal is to make consumers believe that bariatric surgery is the exact opposite of quitting. It's finally standing up for yourself and your health. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna demonstrate that Purveya understands that weight loss isn't just about willpower, that often it's overcoming your own body's efforts to keep on the weight. Why? Because sometimes, to find the best of ourselves, we need to overcome ourselves. Okay. All right, does that make sense how that kind of flowed? So we, we start with just a situation, bariatric surgery is one of the most successful ways to lose weight. The problem is a lot of people feel like it's giving up or they're quitting or they just don't wanna um, admit that they, they need help. The goal is to, that it's the exact opposite of quitting. It's, it's not giving up. It's actually taking action for your health in a proven way, okay? So that's how you get there. Let's try to do one for Vandalay Industries. Let's see how this goes. So obviously we put some thought to this and we have some ideas and suggestions because we want to make sure that there's some content up here. But if we were, if we're put, try to put ourselves into the heads of, um, customers of Vandalay Industries. So I'm a, I'm a CEO or I'm a top engineer at a medical device company. I have a great idea for this new product. I don't know who to partner with. What are some of the things that are going on out there that might affect, um, affect my business and affect my decision? For example, we'll throw out a couple just to get us kind of started. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple earlier. One is just that uh, medical devices are incredibly complex and limited applications. So that's just a fact. Right. It's a complex yep. industry, not a whole ton of people can use it. Yep. That's something we probably want to do. Mm -hmm. Another one we threw out, just to keep it rolling, um, highly regulated industry. It's just a tough industry to get FDA approval on. Any other key facts you guys could think of, just trying to put yourselves into the heads of these people that might affect their decision or affect their business? I know this is tough, so I, I get it if there's not a lot. 
What's that? Budget. Exactly. Yes. So key fact. Yep. Creating medical devices is incredibly expensive. Like you're putting a ton of resources on the line when you sign one of these contracts. That's perfect. Anything else? Those kind of key facts. Like along those lines too, you're putting a ton of resources on the line and that means you kind of have to be right. You can't get it to the market and have invested all this money and then get to a point where this thing fails and you have to start over. That's yeah, absolutely. We've heard outcome. stories of, you know, through our work, we've heard stories of companies that have literally gone under because they chose the wrong EMS partner, right? They, they put all their hope into this one company, the company gets 30% through, they say, we can't figure it out, the science is too hard, and they quit, and then the company tanks. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's maybe that's kind of the key thought. I like right? that one. Yep. We so, can, so we were doing this like we'll magic. <laughs> <laughs> so our key fact: creating a new medical device inherently contains a massive amount of risk. Okay. So if we know that's the objective thing that's going on, what's the problem? What? So if I'm that CEO, what's my problem? What's keeping me awake at night? Because. The company going under. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good one. What else uh -huh. might be a problem that they're going to face? They're gonna face probably problems of like, how do I trust? How do I vet a partner? Like, how do I get someone who is going to be transparent and not pull, you know, not leave me dangling like I've heard of other companies mm -hmm. out there? What other ones, John? Yeah, um, think, in, think in emotional terms too. You know, we talked about those giant B2B purchases. There's a ton of fear and anxiety, right? So if I feel like, all the pressure is on me to make sure I choose the right company. I've got all these risks I've got to worry about. That, you know, it, the pressure can be incredible. Mm -hmm. Any other Any other thoughts other of what thoughts kind of problems that? they might be facing or keeping them awake at night? I'm going to say that's probably, probably close to the key thing. So maybe the problem here is that all I see are the risks and the fears and the things that can go wrong, the failures that can happen and exactly what, what somebody mentioned, that you know, I've heard of companies going under because they chose the wrong electronic yeah, manufacturing exactly. service provider. Okay, so key fact, a lot of risk in developing these. That risk makes me as the CEO just feel angst, right? Like just, this is a big decision. My career's on the line, my company's on the line, millions of dollars are probably on the line, yes, et cetera. There are a million okay. ways this could go wrong. Now we, now we understand where our customers are at. Now we have to figure out what is our goal. How are we going to change that? What's the, and this is almost always a belief. Like what do we want them to think or believe afterwards? So. Right. If the mindset that's created by that, that situation is all of these things can go wrong, what do we want to change that mind to? Yeah. So, and this is where things start to narrow pretty, pretty easily. You don't have to like grasp around as much. Um, wording matters a lot more at this point. Up in the key fact, you're going to come up with a bunch. You're going to come up with maybe 5, 10, 12 different key facts. Then you're going to pick like the four that you think are probably going to lead to a compelling message and just keep chasing those down, right? Mm -hmm. Because you'll want to see what, what works and what doesn't. So, but by this point in the creative brief, you should be pretty clear because now you have, an, you have a problem, fear and anxiety, and we, the belief has to address that, right? Mm -hmm. So what yeah, do we so, want to do? Right, so one way we could approach that is we can tell them, we want to make them believe that you don't have to face this alone. Yep. Right? Right. Make them believe that our company is more transparent than other companies. Make them believe that we have a proven track record. Now, we don't want to talk about our company yet at this point, so mm -hmm. um, we're going to save anything that's specific to us for the next field, the creative strategy. But yeah, we're going to try to make them believe. What are some other examples we had there? Yeah. Um, Another thing, you know, we, we touch on this a little bit in the um, positioning statement too, but you know, the idea that these medical devices make a big difference in someone's life, so maybe what we need to do is remind them of the passion that they had in the first place. Why were you trying to do this in the first place? Does that make sense? Does that work, I think? So where do we, where do we land? You want to land here? Yeah. We can, we can land I think here. so. <laughs> this is a good one. Okay, so our goal with all of our messaging, our new website, our new brand, is we want to make sure that these, these guys and these gals believe that choosing an EMS provider doesn't have to be a gamble. It doesn't have to be this big, risky crapshoot, right? Right, so not everybody is out there trying to steal your money and run away. 
there are some out there that are, that are truly going to help you. Yep. And so these last two fields we'll just shoot through because I think they're going to come together pretty clearly. So the creative brief, how are we going to do that? This is when you would go back now and you'd look at your USPs and your UBPs and you'd start to, and your positioning statement, and you'd try to figure out, well, what, what sets us apart, right? Right, and this generally starts with demonstrate that our company, whatever. So if we're going to demonstrate that our company can help you solve this problem, we might look at things like we consistently solve the problems that other people can't, or we um, have the, the process that supports you throughout the whole product life cycle, things like that. What do you so think? let's go ahead. Let's give it to them. So demonstrate that Vandalay Industries understands what you're up against. And we've built our company for one purpose. To mitigate risks and provide the thinking, tools, supply chain, and processes to make your dream a reality. Now, that's long. We wouldn't normally go that long. But the, it's only long because of the stuff after the colon. The most important part of the creative uh, strategy here is we've built our company for one purpose. This is why we exist. This is the thing that we do. Right. We have built our company around mitigating risk. Yep. We understand you. We understand what you're feeling. That's what our company is for. Right. And why do we do that? Because fear should never stop you from doing work that matters. So if we understand fear is your motivation or your, your pain point, and we understand also that it, it can be a really big gamble to do this, we, our advertising goal is to keep you focused on on the benefit, not on the, on the dark side, right? The light side. Right, so if we look at that as an overview, we've got our key facts, we've got our customer problem, we've got our marketing goal and creative strategy and our reason why. Um, you remember when we looked at what the tactics would be, I would be willing to bet. So let's, let's think about those tactics again. I would be willing to bet that all of you had sort of a picture in your minds of what these things could look like, what they could be. Um, I would also be willing to bet, hopefully, that having gone through that exercise, you're thinking about these a little bit differently. So just like Caleb was talking about with the, the bariatrics campaign, it would have been very easy to just come in and say, we've got awesome doctors, come to us. Doing the homework, forcing ourselves to do that homework got us to a better place where we can connect on an emotional level. The same thing applies here. We could have said our tour stops are going to be all about our awesome capabilities and how we're, you know, just how hard the things we do are and how great we are at them. Um, our presentation templates probably would have just been, you know, whatever PowerPoint template plus our logo, trade show presence, all of these things. Now that we've gone through this, we know every single thing that we put on that tour, the content of the way somebody's delivering the, the information, everything we do with the templates and the trade shows and whatever else we do has to point to, we understand how much fear and anxiety you're feeling, and we don't want that to get in the way of the awesome thing you're going to do. So that should be, that's a pretty big difference, and that's, that's how they got to this. Exactly. Right? So this was not, hey guys, give us some awesome ads. This was a very clear strategy, um, a very clear uh, presentation of who we are as a company and what we believe in and understanding our audience, understanding the fun and the imagination and everything that goes into us. And now, again, it feels a little bit like cheating to show an awesome Lego ad, um, but this does exist in B2B as well. Um, and there are some great examples out there. We were going to show you a video, but our audio wasn't working. So I yeah. apologize for that. But, but if you look online, we'll, we'll post it in the video that we post later.
So, you know, examples like Amazon or like GE, where they've done a really good job of understanding their customers, understanding how they're feeling, creating that strategy, having a creative approach that's going to address them and, and make that emotional connection. I especially like this Amazon Web Services one, build on. It's targeted to startups. It's targeted to businesses that are trying to create new things. It's very similar to what we were just talking about for medical technology, right? And you can tell that this came out of some really smart strategic creative. It has the, the handwritten element of dreaming, of back of the napkin kind of sketches, and those two words. I mean, it's just simple two words, build on, like forward ho, let's do this, right? That you don't get there. Amazon could have said, our Amazon Web Services are the fastest, most reliable cloud computing products out there kind of thing, right? Or sale. Black Friday only, get our Amazon Web Services 20% off, right? That kind of stuff. But they didn't. They picked an emotion. Why do people start a business? Because they're dreaming, because they want to build something cool, build on. I think that's great. All right. Well, thank you. So I realized I was a little flustered trying to get the audio together. So we're going to do introductions now at the end. I'm Caleb Shad. <laughs> I'm creative director at Imaginasium. Been with the company going on 10 years. And this is my colleague, John Behrens, associate creative director and lead copywriter here at Imaginasium.